last lecture we have uh, completed parts on uh, transmission uh, equipment used for transmitting fluids pumps compressors blowers and a fluid moving machinery as we call what we are going to do now is uh, for revise what we have done so far and then second uh, the next thing that we are going to look at now in our course is looking at external flows so here we are with respect to our course we are on uh, point number 5 or topic number 5 um flow past immersed object and sometimes this called as external flows because the flow of fluid is outside the object not inside the object inside the object like a pipe so these are called as internal flows this is called as external flows and we are going to look at different uh, things in that one by one just to get you started just to quickly revise uh, from the previous class uh, here are some questions why does temperature rise when a gas is compressed what is meant by compression ratio derive the formula for energy required for compression of a gas in terms of compression ratio in the uh, in the last lecture you you have seen the formula directly and i had asked you to derive it at, at that point of time so again quickly revise your uh, uh, revise the derivation if you have not done it at that point of time you can derive it now <coughs> next important point is uh, why is it necessary to have multi stage compression with inter stage cooling okay so not inert let me just correct that uh, that's a small mistake yeah so inter stage cooling where the overall compression ratio is high what we mean is that in every stage we try to limit the compression ratio and why do we need to do that that's the question that is being asked so uh, what we are going to look at is uh, flow past objects let's start by looking at flow past a cylinder or a sphere uh, when i say sphere this flow would be three dimensional when i say cylinder this flow is two dimensional in the sense that we are seeing the cylinder uh, cross section which is circular and the length of the cylinder is perpendicular to the plane of the screen right so you can imagine that and again so this would be in terms of um, uh, therefore this is called as a two dimensional flow because the flow is varying only in two dimensions in this case r direction radially away from the center and theta direction flow is the same in the z direction along the axis if we are talking about a cylinder and if you are talking about a sphere then the flow is three dimensional this is a, a spherical object and we have seen you recall from our videos that uh, how we try to visualize these uh, flows by putting uh, smoke in uh, different locations and we are trying to follow the trajectory of the smoke or uh, white particles if it's a if it's a liquid so the streamlines bend around the object and you see large vortices that form and these vortices try to compare the size of this object with respect to the distance downstream where these vortices are present or where this flow is disturbed by the presence of this uh, of this uh, uh, of this uh, sphere or a cylinder you can see that the size of the cylinder as compared to the downstream distance where the flow is affected it is several times the distance in which the flow is uh, affected and in fact this phenomena is called as boundary layer separation why is it called we will see that and in fact it this phenomena is used to detect objects like submarines or missiles and things like that where the flow of the submarine in the water you can see the effect of that far downstream even if the submarine has passed you will see or when an aircraft is going when two aircrafts are going they don't uh, they maintain a certain distance so that the aircraft which is following is not affected by the turbulence of the aircraft which is ahead of it because the dis the flow here is very disturbed turbulence is high and therefore it can affect the performance of the uh, of the second plane so this has many many applications another point to note is that far away in the perpendicular direction to the flow so we are going to define two direction one is the direction of the flow from left to right and one is direction perpendicular to the flow like this okay if it's a cylinder the perpendicular direction going into or coming out of the plane of the board is immaterial only perpendicular direction we need to consider is the direction 
as shown here perpendicular to the flow. Okay. You can see that far away from the uh, flow in the perpendicular direction, far away from this object, it is as if the streamlines are practically unaffected by the presence of this object. So, it is as if the flow is happening almost like it is not being, uh, it, is, it is unaffected by the presence of that object, as if the uh, flow does not realize that the object is here. Okay. What I want you to do, imagine this is the situation, let's say this is a cylinder or a sphere. We are trying to look at uniform flow. So, these are velocity vectors. Velocity vector means the direction of the arrow tells you what is the direction of the velocity and magnitude of the uh, velocity is seen by the length of this arrow. So, this length are all the same. That means the velocity is the same at all these, all these uh, locations and it is in the same direction. So, velocity field as we say velocity field is uniform along. So, what will happen is if this is a, uh, if this is a region um, uh, where the flow is affected by the presence of this object, let us say this is the boundary where the flow is affected by the, uh, by the uh, presence of this boundary, this flow will, the velocities will try to bend, the streamlines will try to bend and go around the object. Okay. They will bend and go around the object. Look at this streamline. This streamline is directly perpendicular to the object. So, it is just going to hit here. What I would like you to do is to plot, let us say, velocity or pressure as we travel this distance, as we go along this axis. I would like you to plot velocity and pressure. So, do that. Pause the video. Do that for yourself and then we will see the solution. Okay, so if I plot velocity first of all, okay, in this region velocity far upstream of the object, this portion is called as upstream of the object and this portion is called as downstream of the object. The left of A is upstream, right of C is downstream. Okay, so as you go from, um, uh, from left to right, you see that the area available for the flow, because now it is partly blocked by the object, so area available for the flow is lesser and lesser, velocities will increase. Okay, so I want you to draw that velocity. Here is how it will look like. If I am plotting velocity first, velocity is unaffected. It is slowly getting affected. And at region B, the velocity is highest because the flow area available is the least. And beyond B, velocities will again try to reduce and then it will reach the same velocity, steady state. So, this velocity and this velocity, they are identical. Right? Velocities have to be same. It is flow is at steady state. Mass balance has to be satisfied. So, velocities will have to be identical. These velocities are the same. Now, think about our lecture on um, venturi meter and orifice meter. Part of the flow is blocked. So, now I want you to plot pressure. If I want to plot pressure, what happens when velocity increases, the pressure will go down. Right? So, if I plot pressure, in general, this is like an average pressure if you want. Pressure will try to reduce and pressure will try to again recover and then there could be a permanent pressure drop in the sense that this recovered pressure may not be same as the pressure upstream. So, if I plot pressure, it may be like this, it will go down, it is like an averaged pressure. So, there might be a permanent pressure drop corresponding to this gap like an orifice meter we have seen. Where is the flow going? Flow is going from left to right. Now look at this region beyond downstream of B. Pressure is higher here in the downstream region. Pressure has recovered and pressure is lower at point B. So this pressure gradient, if you look at, the pressure gradient is from right to left, whereas the flow 
is occurring from left to right. Do you see the problem? I have flow occurring from left to right, whereas pressure gradient is from right to left. You think of it this as if you are trying to run in a wind where the wind is directly coming on your face or coming onto your body, right? You will be slowed down. You will be affected by the presence of that wind. This pressure gradient, which is in the opposite direction to the velocity, is called as adverse pressure gradient. And we'll see what that does in a short time. Adverse pressure gradient. I'm just for pressure gradient. I'm just going to write delta p. Let me just write the whole thing. Let's not write delta p. Right, adverse pressure gradient. Gradient, I'm just writing short gradient. Okay, we'll see what this does in the next slide. Okay, so one more thing. This is just the uh, representation. Look at this particular streamline. This particular streamline is just going from here, hitting here. So recall lecture on Pitot tube. Velocity is zero. What happens to when pressure is? What happens to pressure when velocity is zero? This pressure, if I write Bernoulli equation here. If I write Bernoulli equation here, let's say point one. This is half rho v naught square, and p naught here at this location one. If you want, like our p dot tube. If you look at point number a, velocity has become zero. So whatever this pressure. kinetic or kinetic energy was there we call it as dynamic pressure that will get added to this what we call as static pressure so pressure at a will be higher than an by an amount p not that is the static pressure at this location plus this value Half rho v naught square, and then p minus p naught. If I subtract p minus p naught, divide by half rho v square, it will become a dimensionless pressure. That value will become one at point number a. At point number b, pressure will velocity is increasing. Pressure will reduce. So pressure reduces as we go from a to b. That's the point of lowest pressure. and beyond point b area of cross section available is increasing pressure is uh, velocity is reducing pressure is increasing so pressure increases again so that's the uh, that's the adverse pressure gradient that we were talking about this point number a where velocity is zero is called as stagnation point stagnation point and beyond downstream of b we see these vortices that are formed okay let's see that in little bit more detail okay imagine that this is the surface of the object so we have point a b c now these points a b c are different from these points a b c what we are looking at is we are looking at this small region of the flow we are looking at this small region of the flow and we are expanding this region of the flow okay in the next slide here is that this is the ball surface of the ball or the cylinder and now velocity is the flow is flowing around this object like this from left to right around it is going around now if you plot velocity profile meaning velocity as a function of distance perpendicular to the surface let's say perpendicular to surface we call it as y at the immediate vicinity of the surface velocity is zero just like we have talked about laminar flow turbulent flow velocity was zero no slip condition at the surface it's like you are having a layer which is sliding next to the wall and because it is very close to the wall that layer as if it is held by the wall 
as if it is sticking to the wall and that layer is not moving so velocity is zero at the surface of the object at the surface of the object everywhere velocity is zero we call this as no slip condition no slip means there is no relative motion between the fluid and the object object in this case is solid which is stationary therefore the velocity is stationary velocity is zero and as you see far away from the object velocity is larger almost unaffected that means velocity will increase from near the surface or at the surface as we go away velocity will increase it will be like this velocity will be zero velocity will be will slightly more slightly more slightly more slightly more and far distance we are saying velocity is u0 now we can think about a location where velocity would be let's say 95% of u0 or v0 we can call it as v0 or u0 whatever we like okay velocity will be 95% of v0 and beyond that it is just 95 96 97 98 99 100 so in this region velocity is strongly affected by the presence of the wall presence of the solid object and it is changing from a value 0 to let's say about 95% of the value free stream free stream means far away from the object this is free stream far away from the object Okay. the the choice of 95% is also our own we can say 95% we can say 98% we can say 99% we can say 90% it is up to us but the only important point is we are defining a region where velocity changes from 0 to practically u0 or v0 and then beyond that there is not much change in the velocity that region we call as boundary layer in chemical engineering this is a very important concept boundary layer and we'll see that again and again as we go along in our course not just this course the throughout course by course i mean the throughout four years of your course okay now let's look at point b point b is like our point b here this is the point b that you see as our um, uh, 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 the same point b that you see in this slide okay but a and c are different a, a is slightly left of b c is slightly left of uh, right of b and so on so forth now imagine that beyond c or beyond b c d e f and so on what is happening there is an adverse pressure gradient direction of that adverse pressure gradient is this is the direction of that adverse pressure gradient so imagine that as if you are the fluid as if you are the fluid and you are running at a velocity here you are running at velocity here you are running here at velocity this much you are running here at velocity this much you are running here at velocity this much and there is an adverse pressure gradient so imagine that you are running in a in a wind you are just say walking and let's say wind is 100 km per hour it will as if be you are practically stopped by the wind but if you are running at let's say 5 meters per second and wind is let's say 100 km per hour you will you will automatically slow down your running speed will go down if you are traveling at let's say like usain bolt speed that's 10 meters in 10 seconds 1 meter per second right so that's a very high value you will be opposed by that adverse pressure gradient like the wind if you see but you can sustain your velocity for uh, uh, slightly more you can still um, sort of oppose that uh, adverse pressure gradient in a little better manner so at c if you see the velocity profile regions that are in this part of the flow very near the object they are strongly affected by the adverse pressure gradient regions which are far away are are less affected by the adverse pressure gradient so here in this region you see the velocity profile has changed the shape velocity profile has become zero even more and now once velocity uh, becomes zero near the surface let's say here 
adverse pressure gradient is still there it will make the flow go in the reverse direction you see the flow has reversed here you see the flow has reversed here and flow is going here and now if you plot locus of let's say 95% of the velocity u0 that locus is here this point this point this point this point this point and if we plot locus of zero velocity that is here here let me put that in another color locus of zero velocity is here this point a it is b it is slightly shifted at c it is shifted quite by quite a bit at d this is the point of zero velocity at e it is even more shifted that's the point of zero velocity so you see at let's say e or d you have flow which is going in the forward direction flow which is going in the forward direction forward mean direction of the wind or direction of the free stream the velocity of the direction of the fluid and here the flow has reversed so this gives rise to a sort of circulatory flow these are the vortices that you see okay and the boundary layer now it is this region let me put that in another color we are running out of colors but yeah so the boundary layer is the region where velocity is ranging from 0 to say 95% it is as if this boundary layer which was sticking to the surface which was adjacent to the surface now in part beyond b that boundary layer has separated from the surface we call this as boundary layer separation the region between the two dotted lines that is the region of boundary layer now it is which was earlier it was sticking to the object here now beyond downstream it is here that is the boundary layer it has as if it has separated that's called as boundary layer separation okay and effectively the streamline that you see is now coming at a near the a if we see streamline it is like this it is as if it is going like this you see this streamline it is as if it is going far away from the object it is not sticking to the object like this okay so we say this is called as boundary layer separation and arising out of that boundary layer separation arising out of that adverse pressure gradient recirculatory flows happen and these recirculatory flows are these vortices that happen or that take place here so these vortices may be attached to the object or they may be shedding they may be going downstream from the object you see the recirculating region is here like this okay you can go back to our first lecture and see the videos again for yourself oops sorry this arrow is wrong this recirculating region is like this right you can see the vortices that were being uh, separated from the object and they are uh, going downstream so this is called as a vortex shedding phenomena okay you can see the first lecture video again okay let's go forward now so this adverse pressure gradient what it is doing it is leasing a cause of boundary layer separation vortices are formed here now you look at the pressure distribution if you see the left of or upstream side of the object bad right look at this upstream part of the object bad the pressure is higher here with a stagnation pressure here at a pressure is high on the left side whereas if you see the region bcd if you see the region bcd pressure is lower on this side okay as a result there is a pressure force 
that acts in the direction of the flow that force is called as a drag force and because it is arising out of the pressure we call it as form drag f o r m form drag form drag it is already written here form drag it is just like as if you are suppose you are going in a car or a or a bus or a train and you stick hand out of your window as the as the car is going forward your hand experiences a force in the backward direction right when you say when you stick out your hand when you stick out your hand outside the car okay you feel an experience or a force in the direction opposite to the car Okay. it's not advisable to stick out your hand outside moving cars and trains and buses but just do a thought experiment if you like okay but if you say relative to the hand what is the flow of fluid flow of air air if suppose car is going in this direction then air is coming in this direction and your hand is here so your hand experiences a force in the direction of the flow of the fluid flow of the air so the drag force is in the direction of the flow of fluid it is called as form drag what can we say about the region abc and the region adc what would be the pressure distribution pressure distribution would be identical pressure force would be upwards in the region adc and pressure force would be downward in the region abc pressure is perpendicular to the surface recall from first lecture that's why all lectures are important these pressure forces would just cancel each other out so that means pressure distribution is symmetric about the line ac and there is no net force perpendicular to the object the force perpendicular to the perpendicular to the flow we call as lift force so this force is perpendicular this is a mathematical symbol for perpendicular you might have seen perpendicular to flow we call that as lift force we'll see that in a while when lift can be there and how lift cannot uh, and how it can be uh, calculated okay let's go forward so this boundary layer separation is strongly dependent on shape of the objects for example if it is sphere like this boundary layer would be separated and there will be a form drag Um, uh, vortices form in this region there will be a drag force in the direction in this case left to right if it's a cube so suppose there is a uh, the, the example of this is suppose there is a building right and this this is a tall building and there is a sort of a high wind hurricane if you like coming from left so the wind or the building will cause boundary layer separations and you can see very large vortices are formed it's much more than what you had here even though the size diameter and the size of the uh, like rectangle or size of the square is almost the same here okay so the extent of boundary layer separation extent of drag force is dependent on the shape of the object if you think about car let's say jeep you see a boundary layer separation here in this region if you see a sports car you see the streamline is almost following even the downstream of the car and you see very little boundary layer separation you will see very little drag force so sports car will experience a very little drag force as compared to let's say a jeep so if both are traveling at the same speed drag force experienced by the sports car will be less drag force experienced by the jeep will be more and if i want to keep this car and jeep going at the same speed 
I will have to burn that much fuel that engine has to do work to overcome that drag force. So obviously fuel consumption in a sports car will be less as compared to fuel consumption in a uh, in a jeep or a bus if you like or a truck. So now we as chemical engineers which car should we buy? Jeep? Sports car? Uh, we will buy sports car. Why? Not because it looks good, because the boundary layer separation is less, the drag force is less. That's the reason why chemical engineers buy sports cars. Yeah, just joking. Okay, it is also dependent on shape. So aircraft wings, if you see, they are of this shape. Okay, and you see if the uh, if the aircraft wing is parallel to the flow of the of the fluid, you see that there is very little boundary layer separation. Whereas if it is tilted, it is an angle, the aircraft is taking off or aircraft is trying to land. The wind coming in is at an angle to the wing. And therefore you can see you will have a large boundary layer separation. There will be a lot of drag. Okay, we will see an implication of this as we go along. We have talked about orifice meter. So imagine this is the pipe and this is one orifice. We are looking at very close up view. This is one part of the orifice. This is the center line of the pipe. You can try to visualize the pipe is like this. Pipe is like this. This is the center line. And this is the orifice. Oops, let me take a nice color. Yeah. This is like the orifice. like the orifice plate. What we are looking at is we are looking at the half the cross section. We are looking at this part of the flow here. So you see flow going around like this. And we talked about vortices. So if the vortices is present here. This vortex is here. And there is a vortex here. And this vortex is here. You see there is a large vortices that are present that causes permanent pressure drop. Differential pressure drop is almost the same as permanent pressure drop. That's why the orifice coefficient, discharge coefficient of orifice C0 is small, 0.6. Okay. So now the drag force has two components to it. Suppose the object is like this. Suppose the object is like this. Then there is no boundary layer separation or very little boundary layer separation, very little pressure force, but because there is skin friction, imagine that you are holding a, let us say a, a cardboard sheet parallel to the wind, parallel to the wind. So wind is coming like this. This is a cardboard sheet. So this cardboard sheet also will be dragged or will experience a force, will experience a force in the direction of the wind. That's not because of the pressure difference. It is because the wind is sticking to the surface. The velocity is zero. We will see that as we go along in the next part of the topic. Uh, next, to next topic. So this drag, we call it a skin drag. And the drag arising out of the pressure distribution, we call as form drag. So this form drag is because of the boundary layer separation. In short, I am just writing because of boundary layer, boundary layer separation, boundary layer separation, I am just writing SEP for short and it is arising out of the adverse pressure gradient. So I am just writing adverse, let us say adverse, let's, let me write the A properly, adverse pressure gradient. That's called as form drag. Skin drag is arising out of the skin friction, like the pipe we talked about. Remember the friction factor in pipe? There was no form drag there. Right? There was no boundary layer separation there. Liquid was sticking to the pipe wall, but that caused a friction, skin drag. As if you are, imagine that you are trying to do an experiment where you are trying to move a block on the surface of an inclined plane, right? And then the friction experience there, that's called a skin drag. So the total drag force is Fd. So now if I have to do calculation, I will have to tell you drag force 
for all kinds of objects for all kinds of shapes for all kinds of liquids for all kinds of fluids for all kinds of velocities so what we do is we don't write in terms of the drag force we write in terms of a dimensionless number just like we have defined friction factor so the drag force is in the units of newtons half rho v square as units of yes newton per meter square and then we take this area that will be in meter square so this drag coefficient is a dimensionless quantity okay, it's a dimensionless quantity and then a p the area that we take is called as projected area so projected area means if it is a uh, square or if it's a cube like this the area here projected area of this object so for this particular case if the size is let's say um, l l the projected area will be l square it is in the this perpendicular it is area projected perpendicular to the wind if it is the diameter is d here and if it's a cylinder so if it's a cylinder like this and flow is going like this projected area will be pi into d multiplied by the length of that cylinder you see the projected area this is the projected area if it's a sphere of size d the projected area will just be a circle of size d projected area will be pi by 4 d square if it's a sports car projected area will be like this this height multiplied by the width of the car if it's a jeep the projected area will be this much this height multiplied by the width of the car that's the meaning of projected area yeah so if it is here projected area is only this much this height multiplied by the width in perpendicular to the screen this height if it is aerofoil or if the wing is like this projected area will be like this this much height multiplied by the width of that wing perpendicular to the object perpendicular to the screen and just like we have seen friction factor depends on a parameter called as reynolds number same way the drag coefficient is plotted with respect to reynolds number and you see this is for 2d objects like a cylinder this is the drag coefficient versus reynolds number behavior compare this with friction factor versus reynolds number behavior if it's a skillant cylinder it will be like this if it's a smooth flat plate it will be like this like this parallel to the stream like this as if it's a flat plate like this so we have drag coefficients for every every object that is um, uh, moving or a, every object that is moving in air or water or relative to the object water or air is moving we will have a drag coefficient so birds seagulls planes air foils vulture pigeons every object we can define a drag coefficient if it's a spherical object 3d objects then this is the drag coefficient versus reynolds number behavior we will see this more in detail if it's a disk normal to the stream normal means perpendicular this is ellipsoid sometimes bubbles are ellipsoidal air ship hulls right and don't worry about this right now we'll see this later on so drag coefficient versus reynolds number is unique to the surface just like we have friction factor in a pipe versus reynolds number and that depends on the roughness of the pipe here it is going to be dependent on the shape of that object okay and you can see the lift force now so if you see the stagnation point where is the if can i uh, can you draw stagnation point in all these cases stagnation point will be here stagnation point will these aircraft the wing is still turned now stagnation point is here stagnation point is here stagnation point is here okay. 
so when the wind is going the stagnation point if the aircraft is taking off the wing is at an angle wind hits like this stagnation point is on the underside this gives rise to a net force perpendicular to the flow of air relative to the wing so this we call as lift force lift force okay and the angle made by this wing with respect to the flow of air undisturbed flow of air this angle is called as angle of attack okay another place so this angle of attack so when aircrafts are designed for take off landing and cruising the the wing shape changes the pilot turns flaps which makes the wings bent or which makes the wings straight okay that reduces the drag so this lift angle of attack and the lift and drag force are related to each other so this is a graph typically for one kind of aerofoil as you see the angle of attack let's say 0 degrees 0 degrees is like this situation okay drag force is very very small and it is essentially the skin drag it is very small but lift can still be there because this this shape is slightly asymmetric you don't see it very clearly but it is asymmetric it's not this graph is not for this wing it's for a different wing so don't worry about that you see a slightly uh, you see a high lift coefficient but as you increase you see lift coefficient increases linearly but the drag increases almost like a quadratic manner you see why because the boundary layer separation has started boundary layer separation is more boundary layer separation is more the drag force will be more in addition the lift force because now the uh, uh, the stagnation point is shifting to the underside lift force will also increase but drag force will increase tremendously beyond an angle of let's say 20 25 degrees like this or like this lift force actually drops okay this lift force is responsible for keeping the aircraft floating in the air it is opposing the gravitational force therefore the aircraft is floating in the air it is the lift force you see that the lift drops beyond a certain angle of attack if lift drops means the force keeping the aircraft floating reduces aircraft crashes to the ground so all these crashes happen because of this region the boundary layer has uh, increased so much drag increases the aircraft engine cannot keep up pace with that velocity of the aircraft goes down drag um, uh, the lift force goes down and not just lift force lift coefficient also goes down the um, the aircraft just is no longer supported aircraft the weight cannot be supported aircraft just crashes to the ground this is this this part is called as stall stall of the aircraft aircraft is stalled s t a l l stall Right. So aerodynamics is a very interesting, uh, a very interesting subject. It is to do completely with flow past objects, drag and lift. That is, this region is called as stall. Okay. So you would want your aircraft to be operating somewhere here. Drag coefficient is small, so fuel is consumed is less. It does not experience a force perpendicular. Engine doesn't have to. make it continuously go which it doesn't have to uh, uh, provide that much energy to make it go forward drag is less lift is high so this is somewhere where we would want the engines to be operating and your aircraft wings are designed to increase lift reduce the drag just one small point which i should mention i think it is there later on uh, well let's see yeah another thing that happens is if the object is rotating so imagine this is a cylinder this is the flow so it's a 2d of phenomena this is we are looking from this angle we are looking at it from this angle this is what we will see now if the flow is going around like this because of the rotation you see in this part the rotation is opposing the flow so as a result the velocities are reduced here in this part velocity the rotation is complementing the flow as if the velocities are increased by the rotation so the velocities are higher here 
if velocities are higher here pressure is lower here pressure is higher here so let me just write that we have high pressure here under side of the object p is high and p is low here now what will happen where will be the pressure force pressure force will be perpendicular from high pressure to low pressure like this pink arrow that we see that's a lift force on the rotating cylinders and then this is the kind of force that is experienced by all sports objects so you can do this for 2d don't worry about the magnitude and so on you can read this later uh, same way it happens for sphere as this sphere is rotating ball let's say it's a football or a or a or a, or a table tennis ball or a lawn tennis ball this is rotating like this around the axis flow is going from left to right in this particular case so i have a high velocity region here on the upper side of the ball i have a low velocity region in the below side or the lower side of the ball higher pressure on the lower side lower pressure on the upper side so there is a lift force ball experiences a lateral force and that's why the ball curves so if you see football kicks the ball actually curves it's because of this lift force it's called as a magnus lift force okay don't worry about the rotation the circulation all these definitions don't worry just look at the final expression the lift force is per, is equal to 4 by 3 4 pi square b cube b is the radius of the ball s is the speed of rotation s was speed of rotation yeah so 2 pi r s right is 2 pi r n how many revolutions per second this ball is doing rho density of the fluid v velocity of the fluid so in football that's how the curve that, that's how the kicks curve the footballer rotates the ball and at the same time hits it so as it is rotating it curves inside and therefore they can score a goal famous example being beckham or ronaldo or, or whoever is your favorite footballer or table tennis you put a top spin on the ball that ball tends to dip very quickly or lawn tennis right in cricket it is slightly different in cricket the uh, in cricket so imagine there is a cricket ball let's uh, well, let's draw here let's draw here so the flow is like this flow of air imagine ball is being thrown from right to left and then the flow of the fluid air relative to the ball is from left to right so this is the ball and in the cricket ball there is a seam so the seam is like this suppose what this does is the boundary layer becomes more turbid so we have seen boundary layer here right so sometimes this boundary layer flow within the boundary layer whether it is laminar or turbulent that changes the nature of the boundary layer separation if the flow is turbulent that means velocities are high it can it can um, uh, sort of um, uh, withstand the adverse pressure gradient is bore boundary layer separation is delayed so same thing happens here in a golf ball or a cricket ball because in the golf ball there are corrugations it makes the boundary layer more turbulent boundary layer separation is delayed golf ball can be can travel farther distance than if the golf ball was smooth or if in a cricket ball because of the seam the boundary layer is turbulent and the boundary layer separation is delayed let's say if this is the center line of the flow boundary layer separation happens here but in this case there is a laminar boundary layer and boundary layer separation happens here so the boundary layer is like this so the flow is going like this and in this side flow is going like this so you see the flow is asymmetric on the upper side on the lower side and that changes the pressure distribution that makes the ball swing one side okay that's how cricket balls swing it's not just for cricket balls and aircrafts for our own chemical engineering applications 
uh, we have something called a stirred tank or agitated tanks. So if there is a liquid here that is to be mixed. We use a stirrer or what is called as an impeller. That impeller looks something like this. There is an object, there is a shaft, there is a disc and there are blades here. So this is called as a rushton turbine. Rushton turbine. Because the person who used this first was named Rushton. Rushton turbine or who studied this more scientifically is the name Rushton. In his honor it is called as Rushton turbine. So it plan view appears like this. There is a shaft here which is connected to the motor and this is rotating and these are this is the central disc and these are blades attached to that disc and D is the diameter from this end to this end. W is the width. This is width W. L is the length of the blade. Now imagine this blades are rotating. Impeller is rotating, blades are rotating. It is as if the flow is going around this blade. Flow is going around this blade. So write an expression for the drag force around this blade. What would that be? Drag force would be CD multiplied by projected area multiplied by half rho V is not square. V naught is relative velocity of the fluid relative to the blade which is same as the tip velocity we can see. Tip velocity. Tip velocity is pi d n like the tip velocity of your pump impeller we saw in the previous lectures. Projected area is now W multiplied by L. Okay. And if we substitute, if this is a geometrically simple, similar impeller, we can say that this W by D, L by D and multiply by D square and then this uh, pi D N square, we can take that. You will find that the drag coefficient, you will find that the drag coefficient and we can calculate this W by L half rho V naught square. power that this impeller will require or power this impeller will deliver will be drag force multiplied by tip velocity. That's why this square has become cube tip velocity. There is another tip velocity. So it is and then we can divide by make it dimensionless just like we had made a power number for a centrifugal impeller. We can define power number as this formula. You can derive it for yourself. So typical CD value is about 2 for a flat plate. See that flat plate where was this flat plate this, this flat plate is parallel to the surface not this this flat plate was parallel to the surface this flat plate is perpendicular to the stream you see drag coefficient is around two two and a half three of that order at high speeds so let's say drag coefficient is two you will find that the power number is around 7.4 and actually measured power number is 5.5 because the blade that is previous to it sort of disturbs the flow that is coming into this blade. So power is not as if it's a one flat plate that is running in a uniform flow. Right. So the power number of impellers, power number of impellers in a pump or in agitated tanks, you can calculate they are the origin of that is the boundary layer separation and then the, that decides how much power is delivered to the liquid for mixing purpose. Okay. One very enjoyable activity for you you see these videos fluid mechanics of drag part one these are videos that are made in old times they are in uh, black and white but they are very enjoyable you will see all the concepts that we talked about so far being nicely explained and demonstrated through experiments you have seen them through slides but these are actually demonstrated through different small small experiments so everybody must see these four videos before going to the next lecture. Okay. They are available on YouTube. You can download also or you, uh, on your mobiles or you can view on the uh, in your web browser and so on and so forth. Right. Each video is about 20 minutes, half an hour or so. Sometimes it is slightly less, slightly more. But these all these phenomena are actually demonstrated. Lift force, drag force, aerofoil, they are actually demonstrated as experiments. So you must see all these four videos 
before we go forward. So we will uh, stop here this lecture. In the next lecture, we'll start utilizing all these. We will um, uh, use all these to calculate different things. Reminder: See the videos before you see the next lecture.